Well, welcome everyone to the Global Greens First uh, COP21 webinar. My name is Kelly Yen. Um, I am the uh, new Global Greens coordinator and I will be the facilitator for today's um, forum. So just uh, in terms of the process, uh, we're all here to, for the purpose of two points. The first is to develop an understanding of the COP21 climate negotiations from the perspective of Greens all around the world, from each region. And secondly, to develop an understanding of our common green political positioning um, on these climate negotiations at COP21. So those would be the two topics that we will be addressing over the next hour and a half. So our lineup of speakers will begin with Christine Milne, who is the Global Greens Ambassador and formerly the leader of the Australian Greens. And she will speak on behalf of uh, the framing of a shared Global Greens political positioning for COP. Following her will be Frank Habeneza, who is the President of the African Green Federation. Following him will be Elizabeth May, who's the leader of the Green Party of Canada. Next will be Alejandro San Martin Bravo, who is the former president of the Partido Ecologista Verde de Chile. Um, following will be uh, Eugene Lee from Korea. She's the co-representative of the Korean Green Party. Next will be Kennedy Graham, who is the global affairs spokesperson and member of parliament for Green Party of New Zealand. Then Reinar Butikofer, who is the co-chair of the European Green Party. And finally, Mayrim Almachi, who is the president of the Flemish Greens. So we'll have a good distribution of perspectives from each region. Um, if you have any questions, you can, again, put them in the chat box. So with that, uh, I welcome Christine Mill to begin her session. Over to you, Christine. Thank you, Kelly. And hello, everyone. I look forward many of you in Paris and engaging with those of you who won't be there uh, so that the Greens can have a strong presence not only in the negotiations but meeting one another and helping to build the strength of the global Greens. This meeting in Paris is critical for action on the climate around the world. Countries have been invited to contribute their intended nationally determined contributions, of, in other words, what they intend to do uh, by 2030 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. An assessment of those contributions by both the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and UNEP uh, suggests there is a considerable gap between what countries are promising and what needs to be delivered to keep global warming to less than two degrees, let alone the 1.5 degrees that the scientists recognise is necessary. So out of Paris, it is uh, not the end of the road, it is another stop on the journey to stronger climate action. So the first thing the Greens will be trying to do there is to lock in at least a review of the country's targets every five years. And part of that ought to be a real push for a date when the world will decarbonise. That's really important for activists around the world. If we have a date by which the world can agree to decarbonise, and the sooner the better, uh, then we can campaign for greater rollout of renewable energy and transition to low carbon economies. We will need very strong transparency and accountability rules for the countries to deliver on their, the contributions they promise because there will not be penalties if they don't as we saw under the Kyoto Protocol when countries like Canada uh, pulled out and didn't uh, uphold their obligations. We, one of the key issues in Paris will be climate finance and I would urge everyone to engage on this because there will not be a successful outcome of Paris unless 
countries step up and indicate how they are going to meet the 100 billion per year by 2020 that has been agreed, and that is mobilising public and private sector finance. It's critical because many countries want loss and damage as part of the climate finance negotiations. What that means is a recognition of the responsibility of industrialised countries for having driven global warming and impacted so badly on so many countries uh, that were not contributing to the problem. Countries, however, like the United States and Australia uh, are not at all keen on the idea of having to pay compensation. So this idea about accountability and compensation is highly controversial but critical that we are involved. Another area that we really need to get involved in in this climate finance area is that the rules are flexible enough uh, to include uh, nature-based initiatives, including things like uh, forest protection that will be important uh, for many developing countries. And the rules around that, uh, we Greens need to ensure respect the, the human rights, uh, especially of First Peoples uh, in uh, many countries. Some of the climate negotiations have led to unjust outcomes for local people. So they are really the, um, the key issues that we will need to be uh, looking at uh, in, in Paris. I would urge people who know uh, Greens who are on government delegations uh, to let uh, Kelly and I know and to let other representatives know because they are the people we are best able to talk with and negotiate with to try and get these stronger outcomes. I'll just um, finish by talking about Australia for a moment. Uh, Australia has a new Prime Minister. Uh, I fear that in Paris he will be welcomed as a prodigal son as if Australia has come in from the cold on the climb. It's not the case. He will talk the talk. He certainly understands climate change. But in order to become Prime Minister, he promised his party he would not change Australia's weak target, weak uh, contribution effort for Paris. So uh, do not be lulled into a false sense of change being in the air or when it comes to Australia. Uh, also, um, Australia's role in the green finance area will be important because we have had an, a, a terrible record having only contributed 200 million so far and we will be one of the countries uh, really balking at the idea of compensation, loss and damage and trying to come up with text that essentially uh, relieves developed countries of that responsibility. So uh, I look forward to the conversation as it transpires today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, next, I'd like to invite Frank Habeneza to share his views uh, from the perspective of the African Green Federation. Um, thank you very much and uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, I'm saying that uh, my message uh, is, uh, is mostly on uh, what the African states and Af African people are expecting uh, from the climate meeting uh, in Paris. Uh, for us in, in Africa, uh, the evidence of climate change is overwhelming. Uh, African states are expected to go into the, this UN meeting with one voice and one position, which is to demand for climate justice for the people on the continent. With the impacts of extreme weather conditions down on people and livelihood, local farmers and the communities will be looking out for a way out of their climate vulnerabilities. Africa therefore needs to emphasize climate adaptation and finance to effectively deal with the effects of climate change. For us in Africa, adaptation is the priority. Climate change is already affecting our people. So if we have any emphasis, then it has to be on adaptation. Mitigation is being forced on developing countries, though they have embraced it. Uh, inadequate climate mitigation ambitions will have untold consequences, especially on the African people. 
So African governments need to mainstream, uh, mainstream mitigation and adaptation issues into all national agendas. They need to define and support national policy frameworks, implement capacity building programs, and funding for appropriate policies. African governments need to be transparent and accountable in all the management of climate related funds. They need to strengthen national institutions, improve access to data and accessing of funds on climate change adaptation in Africa. African governments need to raise their own funds and be self reliant. And um, African governments need to make good use of the Paris meeting in order to seek support and find the ideas in the promotion of sustainable development, mitigation and adaptation goals. Governments need to involve all stakeholders, such as the youth, the civil society, members of the academia, uh, the private sector, the media, vulnerable groups, among others. African solutions need to go beyond projects to resilient solutions and ideas. African states need to avoid the same mistakes that were made in the Kyoto Protocol negotiations. The new agreement should address all the mistakes of the Kyoto Protocol. If not, then the Paris negotiations will bring nothing new, and the hopes to global sustainable development will be jeopardized. The Kyoto Protocol had a market-based mechanism, such as the key development mechanism, which ultimately failed to address climate change in countries with negligible emissions. Africa needs to shift from the tendency of relying on developed countries and get real political backing from visionary leaders around the continent. Uh, the climate change in, a, uh, in Paris is expected to deliver the new climate agreement, which will define global climate governance in the past, in the post Kyoto period. As such, COP21 will be a landmark event in the evolution of the global climate governance landscape. COP21 is therefore seen as a moment of opportunity for Africa to assert itself in the global climate governance and ensure that the outcome of climate uh, of climate, the outcomes of Paris are congruent uh, with the continent's long-term sustainable agenda. Uh, so maybe uh, well, what I would say is that uh, we have been seeing much flooding, uh, 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 desertification, uh, hunger uh, in, in, in Rwanda, in Kenya, even in Uganda. Uh, I mean, we are, people are suffering day and night uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, Somalia, uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, so we we are suffering day and night well, with climate uh, uh, solutions, and yet we are not uh, even contributors uh, to. We don't contribute much. And I almost say like in one, we don't contribute anything at all. Uh, the green was uh, emission. So we think that uh, uh, all of you, uh, all of us, need to do something. But uh, we expect that uh, the biggest polluters should actually pay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Um, next, I'd like to invite Elizabeth May from uh, Canada to share uh, the America's perspective. I'm very glad to be joining you. Bonjour, tout le monde. Uh, je suis vraiment heureuse d'être ici parmi mes collègues dans le Parti Vert mondial. I'm very pleased to be able to share with you that Canada finally has a new government. The, uh, unlike the situation in Australia, and say hello to my dear friend Christine, uh, we haven't only had in Canada a change of prime minister, we have had a change in government. So, avec maintenant, nous avons un nouveau gouvernement au Canada, c'est un gouvernement avec un nou nouveau premier ministre, puis aussi une nouvelle approche. I would not want to overstate the strength of the Liberal Party on climate issues, but it must be said that the Canadian approach will be very different with uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, many of you will remember Stéphane Dion, who was in 2005 uh, the president of the COP when the negotiations took place in Montreal at COP 11. Uh, Monsieur Dion is now the 
Foreign Affairs Minister of Canada and chairs a quite senior cabinet level committee on energy, environment, and climate change. The new Minister of Environment, and note the name of the department has changed, it's now the Department of Environment and Climate Change. She's relatively new, she's new to politics, she's new to the climate issue, but she comes with an accomplished career in international human rights law. Her name is Catherine McKenna, and she's currently in Paris at the two-day ministerial consultations that are taking place there. Uh, the signals from Canada are good, but as leader of the Green Party, of course, we want more than signals. We want substantive changes to Canada's INDCs. Christine was describing those. Canada's intended nationally determined contribution is currently the weakest of any of the countries in the G7. I certainly have been pushing in Canadian media, uh, as well as uh, in my meeting with the new Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and I met three days after the election to have a good conversation about COP21, and we did have a good and detailed conversation. But uh, the Canadian uh, approach at this point has, is not clear whether the Trudeau uh, administration will distance itself from Canada's current INDC uh, either before COP21 or during COP21. I think they must. I think we need to have a different INDC. Uh, in this, I have sympathies for the new Prime Minister in that Canadian targets are usually negotiated with the provinces, and there's very little time to do that between his swearing in. He became Prime Minister officially November 4th, and of course, COP opens uh, November 30th. So the position from Canada, I think you'll see real change. I hope we can stimulate more ambition. I'll be pushing for it. I will be, for the first time, included in the Canadian government delegation. Many of you will remember me showing up at COP as a Canadian member of parliament, but under the flag of another country or NGO. I don't know how many Greens I'm allowed to bring on the Canadian government delegation, but I will be working closely with other uh, Greens who may not have badges to be on the inside. And I think that's my five minutes. Merci beaucoup tout le monde, obrigada, thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Alejandro to speak uh, from his perspective in Chile. Uh, well, um, uh, I will speak um, uh, about Chilean situation and, and some things about uh, Latin American situations also. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Boba Greens for making this webinar possible. Uh, I'm very glad to listen to Elizabeth's uh, words. Uh, we all expect a, a change from Canadian government uh, to be made uh, in this COP. And uh, going to our situation, I would say uh, our perspective is not very um, optimist. I would say rather is pessimist uh, because of two main issues. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, all, almost all countries, Latin American countries, I will speak from Mexico South, um, have uh, plans, mitigation plans, adaptation plans, uh, national action plans uh, for for climate change, but almost everybody is not uh, fulfilling its commitments. Uh, on the hands of emissions, uh, I would say none of our countries are fulfilling its commitments uh, with international uh, uh, international uh, parties. Um, and on the hands of absorption and mitigation, uh, I would say uh, there are a few countries that are working towards the protection of our forests and oceans, but on the other hand, we have big problems in countries like uh, Bolivia and Brazil, where deforestation and land use for agriculture 
is taking over our, our forests. So uh, if we put in, in the balance uh, emissions and absorptions, I would say uh, almost none of our countries are fulfilling its commitments. On the other hand, we are also uh, negative about uh, the negotiation uh, process that is taking place, uh, especially in last month uh, in Bonn and the, and the meetings that have been uh, since then. Uh, we think uh, the strategy of uh, giving co-presidents at the COP uh, major attributions, uh, it's, it will not work it's towards a, 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 a commitment that, that, that the international uh, uh, needs. Uh, we think uh, the, the last uh, part of the, the, of the negotiations uh, have put a, a very have put pressure on some things that we think should be um, should be the core of the negotiations at Paris. Uh, by in, in our hand, we need to state the, the primary um, um, principle that uh, all countries have a common but different responsibilities about uh, climate change. And we are not seeing that. Um, we, we need uh, some uh, uh, commitments from for from developed countries or industrialized countries uh, to to tackle uh, climate change within two degrees. Uh, we need to to assure that uh, the transactions of or of financial and technological transfers uh, are being done or will be done uh, and, and in the real in the real world, not not just uh, in the in the meetings or in the papers as has been uh, uh, come out. So uh, I would say our countries uh, have a, a little share of emissions. Let's say from from Mexico to Patagonia no more than 4% of the, the global, uh, yes, the, the, the climate change gases uh, emissions are responsible by this region, but we have a major responsibility in absorption and, uh, of, it, that, of this. Uh, we have a major part of oceans and forests of the world, so that would be a part uh, that uh, we need to to assure to accomplish and to accomplish that we need um, that uh, the transfer that I said financial and technological uh, is it done thank you thank you Alejandro um, everyone's doing great with the time uh, next I'd like to invite Eugene Lee to share her views from Korea and the Asia region. Hello, everyone. Uh, according to the analysis by IEA, the average global temperature will go up about 2.7 degrees in 2100 at the present rate of progress. Uh, we ask every government around the world to set a strong goal for greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, Korean government's INDC is a 37% reduction goal of BAU in 2030. Uh, we, uh, Korean government used the business as usual level. Uh, uh, we think this cannot be a, a good answer. This percentage is uh, highly disappointing, uh, considering that Korean government uh, now is ranked seventh uh, in the top greenhouse gas emission. And uh, it means Korean government maintains uh, its status as a developing country, even in the post-2020. Uh, this is really serious. 
and also the government think nuclear power, nuclear power plant as a way of reduction, greenhouse gas. Uh, now Korea has 25 nuclear power plants. In addition, 11 uh, more plants are planned to be built until 2029. It means Korea will have a 36 nuclear power plant by 2029. Uh, two, uh, last week, we had a meeting about um, COP21, and the, the government said uh, the way of uh, um, greenhouse gas reduction that Korea can have uh, um, the only way can de reduce uh, greenhouse gas can, uh, greenhouse gas in Korea is uh, uh, nuclear power plant. So nuclear power pl plant is the only way we can reduce the uh, greenhouse ga gas emissions. So it's really disappointing. Uh, we think because we uh, experienced the uh, Fukushima accident, so nuclear power cannot be an alternative to the uh, climate change. But in East Asia area, China, China is uh, now building nuclear power plant, and the Korea will build 11 more nuclear power plant, and also Japan. Japan uh, reopened the uh, nuclear power plant. Nuclear power plant because uh, uh, until last year they did not maintaining. They did not use any nuclear power plant. But Abe uh, government uh, reopened, re maintain, re maintaining um, nuclear power plant. So uh, Green Party Korea. Uh, it's very ashamed of uh, Korean government's IND, INDC submission, and the uh, uh, Korean government should reset the, the uh, emission reduction objective to be more active. And uh, Japan uh, uh, targeted the baseline year 2015. So uh, Japan uh, uh, used to be a NX1 country, but their baseline year is 2015 and the 26% uh, reduction by 2030. So I think, uh, 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 we think Korea and Japan and China uh, need to do more, uh, in, uh, need to do more at coming COP21. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Eugene. Really appreciate yeah. your sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I'd like to invite Kennedy Graham to share his views from the Pacific. Thank you, Kelly, and, and hello to everybody. Um, very quickly uh, on the logistics. Uh, I understand that uh, it's likely that we'll have three New Zealand MPs in Paris. James Shaw, our new co-leader, is likely to be on the New Zealand delegation, which is um, something entirely new. And I and another NG will be there, and we will be much freer to be critical about both the uh, negotiations and the New Zealand government. Um, on the substance of the issue, I agree that the whole, the whole focus is really going to be on what INDCs are, are about to produce, which is 2.7 degrees. And the governments are going to claim that that's a victory and that uh, things are half full. And if there are critics, including the Greens, then we'll be uh, negative um, and they'll try to dismiss us that way. So I think we have to position it in a way that acknowledges that 2.7 degrees uh, is an achievement, but uh, recognizing and making it clear that it's an achievement that should have been recorded about five to ten years ago, so we're very much behind the play. And I think we need to make it clear to the global public that uh, global emissions need to peak, according to the scientists, by before 2020 for the two degrees to be in place, let alone the 1.5. And then we say that that is an unprecedented challenge for humanity, but also an unprecedented opportunity. And we've got to play up the positive, but we can't afford to play up the positive at the cost of um, whistling away the magnitude of the challenge. 
Uh, and then I think we need to focus on the whole issue of the peer review because we're going to go from acknowledging 2.7 degrees immediately on to the whole issue of the peer review. And I think on that, we've got a major role to play on the peer review by saying that, and incidentally, I know for a fact that it was New Zealand that led the charge to move away from top down to bottom up. So we have a responsibility, certainly in New Zealand, but I think the Global Greens have the opportunity to, to say in the peer review process, what we need is to focus on the, uh, the two degrees leading to a global carbon budget, leading to the application of the equity principles and coming out with a precise or at least range of figures, country by country, in terms of their national responsibility to, within the global carbon budget, to achieve the two degrees. And if that's, that's not a binding legal obligation, but the research institutes do produce those figures, and the Global Greens should be promoting them because that is the only navigational compass that we're going to have for the peer review process, which is a voluntary process in itself, to have half a chance of succeeding. On the Pacific, I think the Global Greens have a particular opportunity and responsibility to speak on behalf of the most vulnerable countries, and that not, not least the Pacific and the Pacific Islands, who face an existential risk. We're talking about the survival of nations. The Pacific leaders are very vocal on this. We should be supporting them. And when it comes to the 1.5 degrees that they are promoting, I think we should be saying the numbers should be run in parallel for both 2 degrees and 1.5 degrees so that we, again, we have the compass as to what we should be doing. New Zealand, for its own part, has a very poor record, both uh, gross to gross emissions and net to net emissions uh, over the years. We've got very weak targets, 5% for 2020, 11% for 2030, that's our INDC, 11%, and 50% by 2050, which is hugely inadequate for a developed country. But it's more the question of style. The government is, I think, the style is characterized by cynicism and bombast and a very short-sighted version of the national interest. For example, when it comes to climate financing, uh, the figures, uh, contributions to the Green Climate Fund, range from something like per capita for the Nordics, 40 to $60. For Australia, Canada, US, UK, somewhere between $20 and $8. New Zealand, 60 cents. Not only are we tiny, but we're mean-spirited. So we've got a lot of work to go on that. I think one of the things, going back to the whole issue of um, the, the method by which we in, uh, in improve the peer review system, going from two degrees to the carbon budget to the equity principles, I think we need to be explicit that we, the, 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 both the global debate and the national debates have got around the wrong way. We've been very much focused and mesmerized by policy and cost factors. We need to begin with question one, what is our national responsibility according to that global carbon budget? Secondly, what is our domestic capability in terms of our own abatement? And then thirdly, move on to the third question as to what is our policy and what are, what are the cost implications, having regard to the counterfactual cost implications of no, no action at all. Uh, and finally, just a very quick uh, reference to the fact that when I was in Europe recently, both in Brussels and Stockholm in London, I was talking to colleagues, green colleagues, about the, the development of the Global Greens Parliamentary Association and the setting up of a leadership group and also a thematic climate group. And Kelly, who's off to Brussels to be Global Green Coordinator, and I will be working with green leaders on that uh, over the next few months. That's it for me. Thanks. Looking forward to seeing you all in Paris. Thank you, Kennedy. As you can see, we're sitting next to one another. Um, now I'd like to invite Renar Boutikofer to share uh, views from Europe. Okay, thank you. Um, it's very nice to follow uh, right after Kennedy because we had a nice chat recently in Brussels. And um, from from the European point of view, I want to underscore what um, has been said about the uh, possible outcome of the Paris conference. It will be important to play up the positive, even though we all know that the results will be far from sufficient to allow the international community to attain the necessary 
goals, but we should insist that there is going to be a, a binding agreement on the basis of the INDCs. The five-year clause is very important, the review clause, climate finance, and I would also want to stress that it is uh, highly important that there should be language in the uh, agreed uh, deal that hints at or explicitly mentions ambitious long-term goals that could either be um, the two degrees centigrade goal or the decarbonization goal, but I think it would be important with a view to future reviews to clearly state the long-term goal against which uh, progress have to, has to be measured. Uh, one issue that we would like to discuss a lot would be the phase out of fossil subsidies. I think that could be a commonly shared approach uh, globally from Greens and others, environmentalists. Uh, it's easy to understand why that would be a primary goal, and it could help in changing the economic logic that we must change if we want to uh, make uh, the pursuit of a low-carbon economy a uh, realistic endeavor. The second uh, emphasis that we are trying to pursue is uh, the carbon divestment movement, uh, looking into the carbon bubble conversation that's been popping up lately. It's um, been kind of a spillover from the U.S. Um, happily welcomed in many European countries. The first the city council in, in, in a major German city has just recently announced a decision that they will divest uh, all their assets. Uh, I think this is a, a great opportunity to uh, join forces with others and to reinvigorate civil society movements. And thirdly, I would also think it would be important to combine the discussion about climate change and our policies in that regard with the ongoing discussions of trade agreements like the TPP, the TTIP, or the CETA agreements that are being negotiated or have been negotiated recently. The European governments are probably more confused today about their climate goals than they would have been six years ago in Copenhagen. Uh, countries like Poland are emphasizing coal very much. The UK is trying to re-engage with uh, nuclear technology, also joining forces with the Chinese. Um, but civil society is um, more energetic, I would argue, than it has been over many years. We see faith-based groups, for instance, getting into conversation that in this as I'm basically optimistic that we can use the COP as a point for a more big society organization that we can team up with others. Okay, great. And now we move to our final speaker, Mayor Mamachi. It would be a pleasure to see all of you and to uh, see my fellow uh, uh, Green leaders all over the world. I'm very honored to be able to, to give uh, a little bit more insight on what is happening in Belgium. I'm the leader of the Flemish Greens, that is the Dutch-speaking part of uh, Belgium. Uh, Belgium is a very complex country in, in terms of structure, and uh, this is resulting in a very poor um, result on uh, climate uh, um, decision making. We have four ministers who are accountable on tackling the climate change issue, and since six years, the last six years, they haven't taken any decision for the last year and a half. 
they haven't funded the climate fund, although we are supposed to do so. So this means that we are going to Paris, we are three weeks before Paris without even having fulfilled our obligations from the last um, summit and that we aren't fulfilling our European obligations. Um, but I, uh, um, I agree with what Reinhardt said in opposition to what is happening amongst um, the, the, the government, we see that civil society is uh, stepping up. There is a divestment movement. There are people who are going to court, 10,000 uh, civilians in the Flemish part alone. Uh, we see NGOs stepping up, and this is a very good uh, evolution. Um, and this led to, to my idea, and, but this led to, to a little idea in my head that what the four ministers in Belgium can do, the Green parties worldwide should show them um, how it can be accomplished by uh, promoting their own proposals. I have heard a lot of interesting ideas now here, but I think it is important that uh, we share a common statement before we go to Paris. So four ministers, can, four ministers can't do it in Belgium. We can do it with 90 Green parties in um, worldwide with our propositions. Uh, and this can help uh, our leaders uh, tackle uh, the same issue on the COP21 in Paris. So I've come up with this idea uh, first for, for Belgium, but I think it would be a great a hell of a statement worldwide if we as green leaders worldwide would make a common statement, very simple, a selfie uh, with ourselves about what unites us as Greens, the fight against climate change, so that we want to keep climate change under or below 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If we can all do this two weeks before the COP21 summit, we can, uh, we can uh, launch a press release all simultaneously in our own countries saying that together as green leaders we are making this statement because the matter is very urgent. So what I would ask you, if you think this is a good idea, that take a picture of your party president with the statement in Fahrenheit or Celsius, which is appropriate for your country, to make one simple proposal which is suitable for your country on how to tackle climate change and to send the picture and the proposal to me. I will make a compilation of everything and will send it to Margaret and Kelly uh, of the Global Greens, and they will put it on their website. So Saturday, when there is uh, the press release, everyone worldwide can go and check out the different proposals of the Greens on the website of the Global Greens. This idea has sprung from the simple fact that I think it is important that we make a lasting and very positive impression towards Paris and show that this is a, a, a problem that we can tackle and that our governments aren't showing enough ambition uh, while the civil society is trying to do what they can. So the selfie uh, with the statement, it takes no more than five minutes. A proposal, everyone has proposals ready in their own country. Um, it would be very powerful if we could collect all this. Um, and if uh, we do it um, in, a, in a large number already, I have about 30, 40 uh, party leaders who have already reacted, responded positively. But if we want to do it this weekend, I would uh, urgently ask your help to, uh, to raise the number even higher. So um, I have a draft press release. I have uh, everything ready for you just to translate it into your own language and to make it suitable for your country. It's, it takes literally only 15 minutes, but it would make a hell of a statement and it would make us uh, very visible in this whole debate in a very positive way. So I'm calling out to you um, to take part. Um, we can do this. It's, it's not hard. Uh, we all have been studying on the dossiers of divestment and, and, and reforestation of isolation. So everyone can think of uh, examples. I have an example from Mongolia to no longer use ch uh, coal for, um, 
for uh, for heating their yurts, uh, their tents. So things like this are very uh, interesting, and um, it, it is short term. But I would like to ask you to think about it now, and if you want to participate, to let me know. Uh, by tomorrow, uh, everything is ready. I have it in four languages, in Spanish, French, uh, in German, and in English, and I have the draft press release in every detail. So all I need is your participation, and I think that would uh, uh, be, and then we could, uh, we could uh, uh, make this a big success. And I don't know why, but I can't go to my last. Ah, yes, we need you. Now is the time. Make us stronger as a global family. I'm, uh, I've been elected a year ago. I'm very much looking forward to meeting every one of you. And if we can do it in a positive atmosphere, we shall make the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nirim. Uh, we're at our last few minutes. Uh, so with that, I'd like to invite each of the panelists to give a final uh, concluding statement, there, which is, just their key message that they want us to go away with. Um, please speak maybe around 30 seconds to under a minute, uh, just your final statement. Um, and I'll take it in order of the speaking orders, starting with Christine. Um, thank you, Kelly, and thank you everyone for participating. The key takeaway is the Greens have a critical role to play in trying to strengthen the agreement in Paris and being organised for the post-Paris period the next five years. In other words, it's going to be critical. We need to engage and get together in Paris. We need to communicate that around the world. Most importantly, we need to strengthen our bonds as a Green family to have maximum political effect in Paris. So please make yourselves known to the Greens in Paris and let's engage with a strong dialogue uh, through the Global Greens. Thank you, Christine. Frank, what is your key message? The key message is uh, that uh, we uh, from Africa, we are demanding climate justice. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, since we are already suffering uh, the consequences of the climate change, uh, people are already dying, as I've just mentioned, that even in Zambia, the whole economy is collapsing. Uh, the industries have closed down uh, because of a uh, problem of water management. The dam has closed and there's no electricity, so people are suffering. So we need to see that uh, uh, the issues of mitigation, adaptation, I mean, we, are, we, we need adaptation to us is a priority because the climate change is already affecting everyone and uh, mitigation, yes, has been good, but it's not the solution. We need adaptation immediately. So we need to have finances. And uh, we, uh, those people who are polluting should be able to pay because we are not polluting in Africa because we don't have industries. So those who have industries who are polluting uh, should chip in more funds into the, uh, this new uh, green fund, green credit fund. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Next, Elizabeth Hayes. Thank you, and thank you again to Global Greens for organizing this webinar. And thank you to Green Party members from around the world who signed on to chat with us. I agree with everything that uh, both Frank and Christine have said, and I know I'll agree with what Kennedy Graham's about to say and everyone in the Green family. We need to, to, by working together, we are stronger. We're in the best position of any political party globally to point out that the insufficiency of the current agreement. We're going to need this agreement, but it's clear that leaving Paris, we will not have the agreement that avoids two degrees Celsius global average temperature increase, barring a miracle. Now, I, I, I would love to see that miracle, but I think it's increasingly likely, uh, knowing that the current INDCs put us as high as 3.7 degrees above the pre-industrial revolution climate uh, at temperature level, we have absolutely got to push harder. We need to push harder between now and November 30th and then keep on moving, as Christine has said, in the next five-year period with a five-year review critically being built into this treaty. So communications will matter, political mobilization will matter, and I look forward to working with those of you who will be at COP21. Wonderful, very empowering. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next, Alejandro. Okay, um, I would say, that it's very important for us to 
to return that the time has gone out. It's a, it's a time to act. It's not enough to get a, agreements, actions, a, plans, and plans. We need a, to get financing for that actions and for that plans. A, global Greens must play a key role in setting an urgency sense in the discussions that in Paris will take place uh, in one month. So I would say that's the message. Great, time to act. Next, uh, Eugene, share with us your, your key statement. Yeah, uh, uh, today's meeting is really happy for, for me to prepare for the COP21. And the uh, uh, Korea Greens will join the worldwide people's climate march on November 29. And uh, uh, I will participate in COP21 as a global green and uh, as a representative of uh, uh, Korea Greens. Uh, we will publicize the problem of Korean INDC in Paris. And if possible, uh, we would like to prepare, have a cool uh, statement among Asia Pacific Greens. Uh, Korea Greens uh, already have a kind of statement, so we will share, share our statement with the Global Greens. But if possible, we'd like to have a uh, cool statement among Asia Pacific Greens. And uh, I'm really looking forward to working with the Global Greens in Paris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugene. Next, Kennedy Graham. Thanks, Kelly. I think the uh, the two takeaways are civic action and, uh, in my view, civic action and national responsibility. Um, obviously, the Global Greens have to be in the forefront of the civic action to put pressure on all the governments. And I think we may could well emerge from Paris with a rallying cry from 2.7 to 1.5 and see whether that then coheres uh, around the world in, in what we can focus on as a, as a Global Green movement. And uh, for example, um, and it isn't just the marches, they're critically important, but other action as well. Um, the Green Party tonight in Wellington is hosting the film, This Changes Everything, and I'm speaking there. And, and this is the kind of message I'll, I'll try and get across, um, unprecedented challenge and unprecedented opportunity. Uh, but I do think that when we're putting pressure on the governments, we have to move to to what I was saying earlier, to, to focus on and speak insightfully about the national responsibility of each, each country, including our own. And we can't shy away from the figures. We've got to work with the research institutes to get the figures for each national responsibility of each country uh, in that movement from 2.7 to 1.5 and put pressure on the governments uh, with specific figures. Um, they don't have to be rigid and firm. And it doesn't have to be top down, but it does have to be a navigational compass uh, so that we have credibility when we're putting that pressure on the government. Civic action and national responsibility. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Next, Reinhard. Please, the mic is yours. My key, my key message is it's alliance building, stupid. Let's be bold and in including people from all corners of society and from all walks of life. And let's focus on carbon divestment as one particular strategy of empowering people to fight successfully. Great. Um, and last but not least, Marin, what is your key message? Uh, a scandal going on that people are moving, that the governments are frozen, that the alternatives and the possibilities and all the solutions are out there, and that they should be applied worldwide to have climate change, to tackle climate change, to have climate justice, and to have a sustainable future for everyone all over the globe. Um, so I think uh, I agree with uh, with the, with the concept of responsibility of our uh, of our uh, leaders who are in. Uh, government worldwide because we see that the general public is taking it up already and they are the ones that already are feeling the, the first um, changes in climate uh, in their houses, in the places where they live. 
the deforestation uh, and, and so on. And we will have the first climate refugees um, uh, going uh, searching for a place to live uh, these years. It's already happening. So for me, we should uh, bring out that the solutions that are out there, that people are willing to build a better future, but that it is the leaders who are staying behind because there are a lot of other interests involved, the lobbies of the big companies, uh, the oil, and, and so on. So divestment for me is also a very important one. Thank you, Mayor. That's great. And on behalf of the Local Green COP21 campaign team, uh, we are developing a program that integrates all of the activities organized by Greens in Paris. Uh, so I will send you that link along with Marin's documents to all of the participants. Uh, as that evolves, there will be at least three core events that we will organize for the broader Greens community. The first will be a Global Greens networking event at the start of the first week uh, of COP21. Then at, on December 9th, there will be a Green Family Breakfast for Green MPs and party leaders. And at the end of the conference, towards the end of the second week, we will hold our press conference as we do with each COP. Um, if you want to receive uh, information about each of these events, uh, please submit the contact form, which will be included in the email that I'll send to you all. So, uh, as everyone has said, we play a very important role uh, for the world as Greens and as a global community. So, it is a challenge, but it's a massive opportunity. Uh, with that, um, I think we've come to the end of our webinar. So, congratulations to everyone, and thank you for participating.